friends, uh, the No Bullshit Gaming Podcast to have gamers session number seven. We are discussing latest news, fun stuff, and, and dropping some knowledge. This one is actually definitely special because we have a special guest. So uh, basically, my name is uh, Matej Lanchez. I'm the host, but we have the usual suspects here. Felix Braberg, Jakub Remiar, and the special guest is Nico Vereke. Hey, man. Welcome, hey, man. Welcome, Thank everybody. You. And le- let's do the let's do it like this. So, Felix, you know, uh, we know you are keen on doing the intro. So let's start with you. And, uh, and then uh, we will uh, have a quick round of intros. Thank you for that beautiful handover, <laughs> Marce. And uh, <laughs> pleasure to have you here, Nico. Uh, I'm Felix Braberg. Uh, I'm the director of ad monetization at Network. Uh, Network is a gaming company that recently got bought by Forte, a crypto company. Cool. Yeah, I can continue. So, name's Jacob or Jakub, uh, currently head of monetization at Treplight, a free-to-play company from Tampere, Finland, and been working here in the gaming industry for like last like six, seven years on mainly free-to-play gaming side, but also did a VR game, so been there, done that. <laughs> nice. Nico, how about yourself? Should I go? Yeah. yeah. So, um, I'm Nico. I am um, an investor in crypto gaming VC at Bitcraft by day. And then I also host a podcast, another one where, you know, yeah. I got to know Matei where he came and <laughs> talked about UA. Um, <laughs> he, he threw around all of these acronyms that I didn't know what was going on, uh, but I learned a lot. I and see. now, you know, when people say um, ARPU and these types of things, I can actually, I, I know what's going nice. on. So um, I've, yeah, I've, uh, Super, super happy to be here, oh, uh, ready to jam, talk a bit of crypto because that's um, what I'm mostly interested in and what I'm lo- mostly looking at as well. Nice, yeah. And then, uh, well, my name is Matja Lancharij. I'm, well, the independent UA consultant working on free-to-play games, but also now dipping into the crypto gaming as well. So uh, definitely want to learn more. And uh, as the greeting at the beginning, uh, you know, um, suggested, we are now going to talk about the crypto games and blockchain gaming. As NFTs, crypto and blockchain gaming are filling the the headlines, you know, we are now wondering like what's what's happening with the crypto because we are definitely not at the peak as uh, we were at the beginning of well November two thousand twenty one. Now let's uh, let's look at what's uh, what's happening in uh, you know at the end of the. February 2022. So, Jakub, mm-hmm. uh, I know uh, you are definitely very keen on uh, discussing everything uh, regarding crypto, and you are our own crypto skeptic here. So, <laughs> um, I'm usually the skeptic with everything. So, it doesn't yeah, matter. that's that's very true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let, let's start off by saying that uh, most of the stuff that's currently flowing around in the internet, and that's been pretty much the starting point of this whole thing, I would say, was done there somewhere in November, where Axie was like hitting the infection point about its virality and people pretty much talking on the internet about it all the time. There was this excellent uh, deep dive done by Navic that pretty much was the 101 article to go to do anything crypto gaming related. But I guess... Times are slowly changing, and yeah, that's the frame of this current discussion that we want to have a fresh look and see what's currently happening. So l- let me just start by saying that currently even the buzzword, I think, is changing, and I hear it from most of my friends already that let's not call it play to earn now, and let's call it play and earn, and some of those even going to the extent that let's call it play to own only. <laughs> Because I guess the main main point here is that the sustainability of Axie economy as laid out in the research is pretty much fulfilling the prophecy of not being sustainable on the financial side, of course. Uh, if I get it right, and like usually when we try to estimate the game success or game current states, we go on a penny sensor tower or any other analytics. But that's not possible for crypto games. But what's possible if I get it right is to go on sites like Daypreader, like... Um, Decentralized app yeah, the question applications, is, rather. And yeah. Sorry, Jakub, or, or G- JR, Mr. JR, <laughs> just a quick interruption. Like, is the is this uh, side, uh, the app rather, like, um, with the real data? Everything is like, can we compare that to Epony or Sensor Tower, or is it like more accurate, actually? Um, I think from, from the blockchain side, it is yeah. more accurate. So yeah, it knows okay. exactly everything that's happening on the blockchain side. Okay. That said, um, there are a lot of crypto games who are not fully on-chain. 
mm-hmm. okay. um, which makes it hard to calculate, right? If, if you look at the numbers from Axie, um, I think in, in, in August or in September, they were saying they had two and a half million daily active users <laughs> or monthly active users, um, but the number of active wallets was, was, was lower. Okay. Um, and so there's, you know, there's what's happening on the blockchain and then there's, there's what's happening within the game. And so um, that radar is theoretically 100% correct about everything that's happening on the blockchain okay. because, you know, that's a single source of truth. But can we, um, can and, we go on to the assumption that in order to play Axie Infinity, you need to own the cats. So you need to be a wallet. Axies. Axies. You have to call them cats. Yeah, yeah. Cats. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people who, who, are, who, are, who are tilting right now. Um, I think um, I think through the scholarship model, this actually changes. So, so, so would you say that in the graph that, that we are currently looking at the Dapp Raider, uh, the whole scholarship of the player base, which is I, I, I guess the number was like 70%, they are not counted in? I don't know. I don't know exactly. Um, mm. I don't know the, the, the exact details. What I assume is, and this could be wrong, that's... Um, a lot of people do, who are scholars do have because there's there's so you need a wallet to retrieve your um, SLP your your mm-hmm. winnings right mm-hmm. um, and so but I think you can play the game as a scholar without having connected your wallet where your SLP accumulates within the game. Mm-hmm. Okay, but so, how do you get the the Axie then uh, as a scholar? I mean, as a scholar, it is it's actually someone else's Axie. Right. Yeah. So it doesn't it doesn't come onto yeah. your own wallet. So you don't need a wallet because otherwise it would be yours. Okay, like, uh, okay, whatever is okay, in your yeah. wallet is yours. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, because on the assumption of looking at the charts, like there's pretty much a nose dive for last month on mm. the graph based on the users and the transactions. Of course, the volume is also like hitting. Uh, I guess that's also thanks to the fact that I think it was already re- uh, reported somewhere around November where the like minimum Filipino wage uh, pretty much was higher than the current Axie gain per hour. And so we already passed that a lot of time, uh, a lot of time passed from that point already. So I would guess it's normal that people are pretty much leaving after that peak. But mm-hmm. yeah, the question is if, if it's actually like the graph is saying, because the graph is pretty much saying that the users halved in last month. And honestly, like it wouldn't surprise me if it actually happened. Um, and as you rightly said in the beginning, I think the narrative is changing from mm-hmm. play to earn to play and earn. Um, and and so, I mean, this is something I've been thinking about a lot. And, and maybe we can go deeper into that yep. mm-hmm. a little bit later into to, to this episode. It is, you know, can you have a game where uh, a s- significant amount of your player base actually makes a living wage by playing your game? That's a question. And and if so, what is that significant amount, right? Can you have 5%? Could it be 20%, 30%? Um, I don't know. It will depend on, on the money going in, the value being created, et cetera. Um, and so the way I look at it now is I think the narrative that Axie itself is also pushing changes from come here and earn money and, and, and earn a living. And we are actually, you know, helping people pay their rent. And I think the narrative has changed to come play a game. It's a fun game. And yeah. you can actually make a bit of money by playing it yeah. and yeah, with that, an emphasis on a bit. Yeah, that's yeah. what the, the new hire already mentioned yeah, in, the, in the blog we get, post. We get to the article, but the other example I wanted to point here is pretty much Tetan Arena, which was the other like game mentioned a lot of times. It's uh, It has this kind of a different funnel where you can download the game normally on stores. You can play. It's free-to-play layer pretty much where you don't earn anything. And somehow, if you go on their website, you can find about about the crypto layer and buy the heroes there. But looking at the data, and, and this is the this is the thing that I know from a penny because I was looking their data, the revenue and the downloads both nose dives and and they are pretty much nowhere when they were before. And so from the Epony side of things, which I guess covers just the free to play economy, it seems the game's dying. But mm-hmm. from the Dep Raider data, it seems the game's already dead by <laughs> for <January>. some time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's like zero users, zero volume, zero transactions. People are already discussing on the Reddit that it's a rack pool or a fraud in, in crypto bro terms. So don't know what's happening there. But yeah, it's kind of a different picture than the current like discourse that you can see on LinkedIn or wherever where people are talking about crypto. And I think it should be established here that like this has moved on forward because as we go like further in the notes uh yeah let's call let's talk in, like in detail about philip's article philip blood the new hire from yantic of course coming into sky maybe Axie infinity where he pretty much said honestly in the article i think it's a really good one where, because i don't think so there's some kind of pr spin of anything he just states the facts which is yeah, this I is, think, this is not it's a super pretty sell, brave to super do. sell article yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
No way. Where, where I quote, we will not be optimizing our game or experiences to drive short-term returns as it's simply not sustainable, where he directly goes into example that we just cannot sustain a game where you go in $5 and out $6. It's not possible. And then we will focus on, on creating a balanced game economy with proper sources and sync, just like non-blockchain ga games <laughs> have done for years, which to me implies that the game is kind of leaning more into the free-to-play space now, or let's say at least the game design paradigm. Uh, but the biggest problem I still have with it is that it still had that funnel friction that those other games don't have. Like, you still need to buy the axes, you still need to go through the whole wallet process. Of course, we're not even talking about the whole scholarship program now, because like what I think the what scholarship program did in itself is it solved the problem of this initial friction with this kind of a temporary solution. But for me, this doesn't seem to be like a way forward even because i remember like listening to some of the games like four or three months ago when they are pretty much building the scholarship programs into the game design of the game but i don't think so like this will fly <laughs> going why forward. you don't think so because this assumes that they are the only ones that's that are able to kind of solve the constraint of this big friction not the games themselves but as as i look throughout the market more and more games are pretty much jumping on the thing that they don't have the crypto layers, the first thing that you interact with in the game. So if we take, let's say, some new games being announced by Come to Us or Netmarble, both of those already have their um, mobile clients on mobile stores with possibility of pre-registration. Even Axie saying that they will do their free-to-play game, which will have axes that are not NFTs. So I guess long term this problem will be solved by the game themselves not as something like a gaming guild or like a third party solution yeah look like it, uh, Philip it, it, mentioned... it seems to me it seems to me like the like the problem when we were struggling within the vr space like because that was also some kind of a parrot <laughs> analog to this where everybody was making vr controllers and everybody wanted to make it this way that way different and so on and and then suddenly oculus made their own vr controls and every other control was just obsolete from that point on. Nika, do you mind me asking actually, because you have quite an interesting view on the kind of crypto space. Like right now, would you say you personally are more excited about uh, play, and, like play to earn, um, like play to own or play and earn? Like what's the most exciting things you're currently seeing? For me, honestly, like these are different names for the same thing yeah. in a way. <laughs> I don't see a difference between those. It's just, you know, people, it's, it's like where the emphasis lies. Um, in the end, I look at Web3. So the innovation for me that Web3 brings to gaming as it does to, in general, the internet is it adds a native economic value transfer layer on top of what we didn't have before, the internet, right? 10 years ago, if I sent you an email with something in it, you had it and I had it. There was no way, no way to enforce scarcity. There was no way to transfer value through internet. And so there were a lot of solutions built for that, uh, which rely on traditional financial infrastructure. Um, and so that is changing thanks to blockchain. And so the way I see it um, when it comes to games, what I get excited about is that, um, you know, when you play a game, you, by being in that game, when it's a multiplayer game, you add value to that game. Right. If if you grind a lot of material that are annoying and hard to grind and you sell them to someone, you add value, right? That person did not have to grind for that material. And so that way you are adding value to that game. And so for me, what, what I get excited about is, is the fact that blockchain game adds this value layer, which, you know, makes players able to capture the value that they bring inside a game. Um, and I think this paradigm will make it so that you know a lot of new games will get developed new types of games so i think that a lot of the you know hate for blockchain games from traditional gaming people comes from they're looking at the games right now and they're like yeah but what would blockchain add to these games and of course you're you're trying to slap a, a new technology on an existing you know thing that already works right so there's going to be new types of games that are designed for this technology, with this technology natively integrated, um, where players will be able to capture the value that they bring. And um, yeah, that's what get, gets me excited. And, and I love my job because I get to talk to the people who are you know, attempting to do this um, and then hopefully <laughs> support the ones who are actually <laughs> going to be doing it. Yeah, and also, I think, I think... Whoa, 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 Mr. Mr. JR, oh, I mean, <laughs> I know 
you know, breathe. We also want to discuss some things. You know? <laughs> uh, I know also from a different perspective, you know, because like the, the free to play gamers or developers are, you know, a bit, uh, worried about the block blockchain gaming, but also like there's the other way around, like <laughs> play to earn pay, play to uh, whatever. They also like everybody says like, okay, well, the free to play model that's cancer, that's really bad for players because, you know, you play, you dedicate time, you pay there and you get nothing in return in play in, you know, blockchain games, you can actually earn money and whatever. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah. I was like, if, if, eh. if you would slap blockchain on existing play to earn or uh, sorry, free to play yeah. games, it wouldn't change anything. Right. Yeah. I think the only thing it might potentially solve um, would be that it might find a way to circumvent the app store fees where you basically reduce the friction where, you know, again, I'm always thinking about, you know, value creation and who captures what part of the value. And what I can, I can see a world where, you know, instead of having to give 30% of the revenue created away to, you know, Apple, um, the publisher would keep, let's say 90% and 10 percent will be redistributed back to the players and there's only a fraction that goes to to what app store um that's a world that i can see where you know blockchain facilitates or helps or be, adds value to it would be amazing world but you know like if you have this kind of this type of um a solution in the game then app store will uh, ban your game immediately and then <laughs> buy <Yeah>. also true <laughs> buy your 90 percent. you will get you will have zero percent and uh, and yeah. then, you know will be a bit sad as yeah. well <laughs> as a developer yeah, I think the the play to earn, play to own, play and earn currently pretty much reflects the amount of financial expectations that we see there currently. As we pretty much lower the expectations, we get to the to the point because like play to own it sounds pretty good to me. Like I, I was listening to the God's Unchained developer and like application for let's say a TCG because I was also playing like a physical TCG, a Pokemon game, and it's it's really good. And I think it's mm-hmm. it's great thing that for instance I remember the Hex TCG game uh, when it shut down uh, in a way. And like, you know, those cards are gone pretty much. So I, I guess even when the clients would shut down, the guy, it wouldn't do much with the NFTs, even they were in blockchain, but still you have at least something. Or, you, you know, people could rebuild yeah, it. You can trade won't. them afterwards. Yeah, you can still trade them, of course. Yeah. So there's definitely some application, but currently, I guess, after some of the faux pas that's been on the market, especially from Ubisoft site, like slapping it in a like, <laughs> random game from the portfolio, doesn't doesn't really bode well for the overall industry. Of course, because they don't add any value to actually those NFTs. <laughs> <laughs> Jakub, I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. Do you consider Axie a failed game? Uh, I wouldn't consider it a failed game. I still consider it like one of the pioneers in, in the whole space. And I think like it's an amazing project, like all respect to the team. But the problem is that what happened, I wouldn't say was anticipated by the team itself. It, like, they didn't even wanted to create yeah. this this type of like uh, layer to play to play to earn. They didn't like, know. Sure they were quite the whole, surprised. Sco- yeah. Scholarship system and and pretty much the whole spin with play to earn was a side effect not only about the, like the game design but also the corona environment that we were living in. And I think at some point it kind of get pretty much bigger than the team's plan, and. And as you can see, like the economy was not designed to sustain that because if people are just grinding SLP in order to cash it out on the market, they're just adding into the economy. And it's pretty much an infinite source of like accumulation because you cannot even breed axes that, that fast, even though they increase the breeding costs and like try to pretty much get out of a lot of resources out of the economy, they, they, they couldn't. But I guess that just tells the, the story of that this was not intended with the game. So I think Axie is like a, the pioneer that, that brings its pretty much, you know, neck to the table, saying that, like, we're trying and we're doing it this way. I think that's great. But the problem is that uh, a lot of things happened that weren't even expected. So I would say mm-hmm. it's not a failed game, but it's not a game that's going to have, like, a, you know, like, imagine something of a MySpace versus Facebook. So MySpace happened before. It had its, you know, advantages, disadvantages, but in the end, a better product got over it. Mm-hmm. So I think that's what will happen eventually, that more and more that we get into these, like, nuances of crypto crypto games and the design that's needed in order to operate them, we just eventually arrive with the better products and players are going to switch. Yeah, but the thing is, was Facebook a better product or there was a lot of hype and uh, a lot of people jumped right in? That's, you know... So you you don't know that. 
You don't know. Can I, uh, Jakub, can I, I'm going to disagree with you. So <laughs> for me, there's a world where looking back, Axie actually, the Axie Sky Mavis team, they made all the right decisions and they mm -hmm. did everything right. And it, it's, I agree that things, you know, got out of hand faster mm -hmm. than they expected and they would have never, you know, expected this. Um, but if you hear them speak about the game, they see the current game as like, an alpha or maybe a beta, like a beta version um, where it's it's still in development, right? They're still figuring things out. And um, I think, you know, looking back, there is a world where they say, look, we, you know, we build up with the hype, we got to an insane peak and then we crashed, like the, the economy crashed and a lot of people got, I, 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 like, I'm going to say hurts, right? Because you, mm. you invest in axes mm -hmm. and, and then the value goes down because the earning power in SLP goes down. Um, but like the number, like the hundreds of thousands of players, they like they managed to onboard onto one like blockchain in general, mm -hmm. right? That set up a wallet that learn how to like buy buy ether from an exchange and purchase something on chain and then like um, like uh, accept transactions that stuff, and then also onto their now Ronin their own ecosystem sidechain, right? So they now have millions. I don't know, billions might be an exaggeration, but a lot of wallets on on mm -hmm. their their own chain. Um, and so for me, there's a world where in retrospect, Axie was like, okay, look, we didn't expect that to happen, but in the end, you know, like if we would do it again, we would do, um, everything the exact same way, because in the end, like they have a huge number of players that have wallets that own axes that know how things work. And, you know, if you look at what they're building now and, and their ambitions, at least, and I'm not saying they're going to be able to successfully execute on, on all of their ambitions, um, I mean, they they've, they already have the player base in the community, um, and so in my so I, I made a bold prediction about this. Mm -hmm. For me, at the end of this year, I expect Sky Mavis or Axie Infinity still to be the most successful crypto game out there because they already have you know the 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 whole community, a lot of players um, who are willing to you know who have the assets and who just want to play some some fun stuff. Are you yeah. are you able to comment on any of those ambitions? <laughs> That's kind um, of I think they have a public about that, right? I think the, the, the way I look at it, and this is me, you know, I used to be a huge fan of Warcraft 3, and they mm -hmm. had like custom maps where you could do like tower yeah. defenses and all that kind of fun stuff. Oh, that was amazing. <laughs> yeah, th th those were, I mean. Those yeah. were the days. <laughs> those were the days. That, that and RuneScape, man, I have fun, fun memories. Anyway, um, apparently uh, I recently listened to um, uh, the Alexander, who is their uh, COO. He was on the Invest like the best podcast and he was talking about you know their axie land gameplay and they want to make like mm. you know you own a piece of land and then you can deploy a mini game sort of thing on top of that um and so again huge ambitions yeah a lot to execute on not sure if that's going to be successful but i mean so i'm saying i don't think there's a more than 50 percent chance that axie is going to be the most successful game mm. out there i think that if i had to pick one game or team i pick them that's okay. basically my argument i know that, that their ceo uh, was on uh, the constructor of fun and uh, i think he, uh, mishka was interviewing him and he said six months ago look um the game is far from being finished so we are not even in the in the middle of the development and now we look we have plenty of uh players hype everything so uh there's uh, a lot of things that that are go going to happen in the game so yeah let's see yeah, like one thing I could add here is that basically uh, by successful, I would define it as usual as we do here in like the free to play space, let's say, which is making <laughs> we do revenue. here in the free to play space. Come on, We're making revenue pretty much because mm -hmm. I still think there's gonna be a game which will be the better product that will just make much more revenue, which I guess will be a free to play game with the proper crypto layer on top of it that will just be combined free to play and crypto revenue bigger. But they are making revenues. They are making 4.2% out of every transaction. No, no, I'm not saying happening. they are not making revenues. Of course, okay. they are making shitload of revenue. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is that there will be probably a better product in the market because gaming market moves so fast. And like ju just an example, remember where there was PUBG and all the rave was about PUBG, then comes Epic with their game that they release after five years. They couldn't make anything out of it. And two months, they converted it into Fortnite and Fortnite is now what it is. Yeah. So that, mm -hmm. that's usually how gaming industry operates. Yeah, but you know, uh, let's uh, let's get back back to the to the blockchain actually, and like, uh, how does the friction look like? Because you know, for me, I am having a very big problems even uh, connecting a wallet. <laughs> <laughs> 
and buying an Xe. So uh, I'm always looking for some other games that are actually, you know, making this friction definitely uh, lower than than what's uh, in Xe. So, uh, is there any any good example that um, that is out there already? Maybe let's go through like the possibilities that are currently on the market. So sure. let's say the first one is the one that I would say would be represented by Axie, meaning that you first need to connect the wallet, you need to transfer currency into Ethereum or Ronin or whatever, some, something there in order to buy the game crypto assets, and then you can start to play the game, which is pretty much the biggest fun. Currently, it's only browser or PC only. Uh, then if we move a little bit forward, there's the games that are having their mobile client on the stores that is kind of hidden with the crypto layer. And then if you are able to somehow get the notion that they are also crypto-based game or it imply, it's implied in the game itself, you go on their website and then there you connect the wallet and get the assets and then they connect it to your game client. I've seen this other game called Skyweaver from Horizon Blockchain Games where they literally have just a two-click connection or creation of your wallet with your Gmail account on the store itself, which I still don't know why it's even there if the store says that like against blockchain functionality, but it's in early access and it's there. It's a TCG game. And as I said, like this is the smoothest one I got ever. And I was able to do it. They are running on Polygon, of course. And then the last one is the one where I think we're heading for where there's a combined free to play internal in-game economy combined with a free like crypto layer on top of it which I guess means that you download the game normally, you even play it without knowing about any crypto, and at some point you get into action or interaction with crypto layer of the economy, which probably even shouldn't be optional, because if it really needs to make an impact and be valuable, it needs to you know, make be a part of the core game loop. And then, uh, yeah, we're going into pretty much uncharted territory here, because question is how stores will then allow it if you are even able to maintain your mobile game client on the stores how's the revenue counted how's you know the whole model pretty much will work currently i guess the games that are representing this category are chromatic souls afk rate from come to us they announced already that they're going to make their nft drop next month in march and then there's the golden boys game from netmarble pretty much same category and of course axie mm-hmm. origin uh the free to play game that axie sky Mavis is doing where they said that first round of axes will be no no nft and then you slowly get get into the crypto layer of the game mm-hmm. yeah okay yeah the the, fo- the the one extra bonus category uh that's <laughs> i would say is represented by animoca is the crazy defense heroes which actually is getting like a really big proud of numbers there with the users and their transaction where they pretty much took an old game from their portfolio and added crypto functionality into it and currently as i see the numbers of their depraider it's going up both on a penny both on depraider so there's also this possibility, but I don't see this that much yet you know, in the market. Three, that... two, one, Apple is going to ban it immediately. <laughs> there you go. There you have the, the crazy it's a question of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I still don't know, like, what's even allowed then? But like, can it, you do you know, these things? Exactly. Mm. Is, it, is it a matter of it's too big and then we ban <laughs> it? Like, you know. I think um, important to address, I think, when we're discussing these types of things is different levels of crypto inside a game because mm-hmm. um, things can go from you know the the i think you know the 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 latest games that you said where you know there is you don't need a wallet or at least you don't think you need a wallet um and it could be that at that point like a game everything happens on the servers of the game itself mm-hmm. and then you have the possibility if you want to take your assets that you have and export them to a wallet that you then own and so that a game could call itself a crypto game um, but you know it can be super user friendly because there's no actually there's nothing happening on the blockchain until up to the point where the mm. player actually chooses to export their assets their nfts or their tokens onto the blockchain um and and that is so that's like one end of the spectrum and then the whole opposite end of the spectrum is blockchain or on chain games um where literally every move so basically the game is the back end of the game happens on the blockchain. Mm-hmm. And what the game studio, so the, the, the game studio actually does two things. So one, they design smart contracts that represent the back end of the game. And then they provide a very simple, uh, thin layer of front end that you can usually run in your browser that then interacts with, you know, the back end on, on the blockchain. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there, every move, everything you do 
gets recorded because the, the one single source of truth is the blockchain. Um, and so that is an, a super like deep integration. And so for me, calling both crypto games, you know, <laughs> there's, we need more nuance because otherwise it's, it's an unfair comparison, <laughs> yeah, right? I fully agree here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but if I, if I understood correctly, putting everything on blockchain pretty much gets you killed in the gas fees later. Depends. Um, I agree. Like if you do that on ETH, um, which some <laughs> games do, right? So you have games like Wolf Game, yeah, yeah. Um, games like the Crypt, the Crypt is one people should check out. Um, you know, if, if, if you ever listen to the Metacost, I'm a huge fan of loot, loot yep. NFTs. Um, like maybe we should keep that for another, because I, I can rant on that you know, for hours. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so there's, there's games that are fully on chain where you need an NFT to like raid a dungeon and stuff like that. Um, and, um, I mean, the so the idea, of course, is you cannot have a game where every move that you make costs like something like meaningful, mm -hmm. right? In the crypt, for example, I believe every move costed like you know fifteen euros in gas fees, I believe, or maybe fifteen to thirty euros in gas fees. But then, obviously, like you didn't do like twenty moves, right? You mm -hmm. maybe rated one, two, or three, and I think some people, one person did twelve dungeons. Um, and, and that's max. So, the, so you basically, your move is, I raid this dungeon. Um, is and that then the David's game? Successful or not. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It's yeah. David's game. Um, and um, so David Amor, the company is called yep. Playment. Shout out. Um, <laughs> anyway, they, um, and, and so I agree, gas fees, horrible. And, and so this is not sustainable, <laughs> right? Uh, the only people doing this are actually people that, for who the 15 euros worth of gas fees the ETH that they bought initially, you know, that was sense, right? Yeah. They're the ones who yeah. invested early and, 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 and so anyway. Um, but I live, or at least the way I look at this is, I think in, you know, five or maybe even less, maybe in, in, in one and a half, two years, um, gas fees will be fractions of cents. That's that's what I believe. Um, yeah, and I, we I'm already see that, right? This assumption, otherwise we won't move anywhere. Yeah. Yes, we, we, we have to. Yes, we have to, and and I agree, and I think technically it's it's possible, right? It's it's just there's these levers of you know the less decentralized your chain is, the more the transaction uh, processing power it can have, and so you know we will have you know certain chains that are more decentralized with higher transaction fees, less decentralized, lower transaction fees, mm. uh, different technologies for different use cases. Some of them might have um, you know high small actions per minute as in you know you don't need to write long things into the blockchain but you do a lot of movements uh, or a lot of transactions and then others will be specific like specifically designed for a lower number of transactions per second or per minute whatever but with more changes where i don't know what would happen like mm -hmm. you know you submit let's say like uh, a, a new like it's it might, might be a city management games where you you know you list all of the, the things you want to do you want to you know have villagers do that and that and whatever um and you just submit it all at, all at once stuff like that Okay. Oof. Exciting future. Uh, it's too deep. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, no. This is amazing. No, no, no. no. This is exactly, yeah. exactly the thing we want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, because I do like all this topic. I don't. What I don't like is all these um, crypto guys uh, shouting about like, oh, this is amazing. Web three allowed us to do anything in the world. Like, yeah, this 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 didn't exist in Web two. Seriously. How is that even possible? Like there was one guy who hired um, a community manager on Discord from their community. And uh, he said like, okay, I was able to do it in like one day. This is Web3. It couldn't be possible in Web2. Like, hey guy, like, come on. Did you ever hear about like the freelancers and, you know, other types of jobs? Like, come on. <laughs> this is the only thing I'm uh, a bit, uh, you know, agitated about. Okay, let, let, let's move on, I guess. Uh, yeah, let's talk about more of these uh, challenges. So, UA. Yay. Uh, Love it. That's my... Go ahead, Matei. That's my... Nice that's segue that's for my you, Matei. Start, start rant. I, that is actually no rant. I, I, as I said, like uh, on the Metacast, I still believe there's just uh, like very similar um, actions that we can do. It's just like with different names and... Uh, and phrases. So basically, in, in free to play, there's the influencer marketing, and uh, in in the blockchain, what I recently found out, there's the key, K O L in marketing, which is key opinion leaders. Mark is like, it's the same thing. Come on, yeah. it's the, it's the same thing. So uh, I still believe the UA. You know, uh, we need to be careful about how we how we measure stuff. And, uh, and basically, 
there are different uh, avenues how to um, direct users into the game. So, you know, browser, of course. But then you have, if you have the mobile client, that's super easy. We're already doing that with you, with normal UA on, on uh, Facebook, Google, or whatever else. The Discord and, and growing the community, that's slightly different. But as we discussed, it's like not the UA per se, but it's a growth or marketing like um, managers. So it's all about the growing the game and the community there is the, the just the one one part of uh, of the whole activities. So I think um, there are different stages here with the with the blockchain games. So basically, before the game is even you know launched, like you still need to build the community, which reminds me more like a AAA game where you just build the community, share the development uh, notes here and there showing up to the, um, you know, all the assets beforehand and every, every time there's something new created, which is very similar to what we are looking at uh, with, with blockchain games. And as soon as there is some kind of like prototype or anything that's uh, playable, then uh, you just promote someone from the community, send them to the, you know, to test the, the playable build, which is also, you know, called the soft launch in the free-to-play space. So there are very, very big similarities between each other, just, you know, sl slightly different. How, how do you see the attribution going here? Yeah, the thing is, uh, this is something that we already tried to figure out when we were uh, sending players uh, at Pixel Federation to our web portal, because we had like multiple um, domains there, subdomains and everything. And there was always, always a big problem between um, the cross domain uh, attribution and uh, cross-platform even attribution. So, you know, there are some like Google analytics and other analytics solutions that can help you with that. And also if you have the web uh, and the browser and everything that's happening there, you have Facebook pixels and everything, you know, you can just track a lot of stuff. Just nobody talks about it. <laughs> that's the thing. Mm. It's concern, very similar that, that you know. Concerning the, the revenue coming from crypto itself, would you say, would there be any problem of putting into the ROAS formula? Yeah, well, no idea, honestly. Uh, but you know uh, where, like from where the revenue is coming from, right? So you can pair it. You know, you have the wallets and the IDs. So uh, if, uh, mm. if the transaction is happening, then uh, you can definitely do that. I'm not saying it's, it's going to be easy or it, if it's easy, but still doable. Yeah, of course. Like I'm not trying to attribute the marketplace revenue. I'm trying to attribute um, players that go on your website and buy your NFTs from there, pretty much, and together with their in-game client. Hmm? Like mark my can words. I, um, can like, I add? A... Yeah, of course. Sorry. Go ahead, man. You know, I was going to say, like, I, I wanted to suggest another, and, uh, and Jakob will, will like this, uh, suggest another way in which blockchain gaming will make things just more complex than they might maybe need to be. Um, so, you know, you just talked about revenue attribution. Um, I think the concept of revenue will also start shifting. So if you look at Axie, um, you know, and we've talked about Axie's revenue. So Axie takes a marketplace fee. I think it's 4.25% on yep. every transaction mm -hmm. that happens in their marketplace. Um, and that's supposedly their revenue. But the game, so the company... Um, Sky Mavis, they own a shit ton of AXS tokens. Mm -hmm. And those AXS tokens also increased in value. Yeah, but right? they, and now so there's actually as well. Now decreased, obviously, right? You're absolutely right. But, but my point is that um, I'm actually looking at certain games that don't have a marketplace fee. They don't take a fee on transactions. Their whole, uh, the way they're going to make money is by carefully designing the economy to own the token that is actually utility within the game, that is essential within the game, and they expect so the value of that token to keep increasing, and then they can either you know do sales to to generate cash to to be able mm. to afford stuff, um, and so you know at that point you know how are you going to calculate revenue yeah. for revenue attribution, um, and so I, I made the case that um, within the world of Web three, I think the three most in demand professions will be one blockchain developers, two. Um, community managers or community builders, yep. and then three uh, game economists. Because I think yeah, you know the tokenomics the, the, designers. That's yeah. Well, be a buzzword. yes, but it's just general. Because the thing is, and I also made a tweet about this. Um, the moment you can use a token that illustrates the value of a company or network mm -hmm. for something, you cannot compare one with the other. So let me give you an example. Imagine that if you held 
or if you owned a share of Apple, the company, you would get a 10% discount when you bought an iPhone. Imagine if that was the case. I mean, and, and it, it would change. Like, you couldn't compare that to, you know, um, uh, a, a uh, share of, of another company that is not within that industry, right? Um, and so I think, you know, that they're calculating the value of something given the complexity of what happens when you have actually value in something that mm. also has utility within a game um, becomes very complex. Mm. But that also means that the whole value of the company is pretty much uh, at mercy of the free market economy at all times. Yes, which is the case in in stock market right now. Right? Yeah, yeah. Felix, right. what yeah. was uh, your thought? No, I was essentially going to gonna tell you, uh, Matthew, that mark my words. Like when we hit a critical mass of uh, you know blockchain games, there will be mm -hmm. guaranteedly someone who makes you know in app like network for crypto games. So you can actually probably do you know. UA through in-game ads as well at some point. It's just a matter of fact. When you hit a critical mass of games, I guarantee you'll be able to do that as well. Of course, and also there is a there is this uh, other possibility that's uh, what I think uh, X is trying to do: just build a free-to-play game, drive a lot of traffic there, and then send that traffic from free-to-play uh, game to your web browser to your other crypto places where uh, you can actually earn money. That's uh, it's just one uh, type of the or one uh, one funnel uh, you, you can use. The Fortnite is doing that currently. They even said that during the trial uh, when they were showing their <laughs> metrics that the uh, mobile clients are pretty much driving uh, revenue into console and PC. So people people who play mobile have like higher chance of buying something on PC and console. There you go. Makes sense. Yeah. So you know, UA blockchain, amazing. I love it. Yeah. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe let's keep this into the like actual thing we were talking, which is the whole business model of like a... actual thing. Do do you mean like UA is not an actual thing? Come on, no no no, come no, no. on. Feel free to continue. <laughs> <UA>. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, let's let's go. Let's but, but go I, I just think like this this is the the like I would say for me the biggest question of them all because usually uh, when I'm designing anything in the game. Currently, free to play monetization equals game design for me. And even the terms that I keep hearing around the industry, that like yeah, game economies and tokenomics, like for me, it seems like we're just piling more stuff and more expertise on the game designers <laughs> or product people. It's, for me, it's the same same person anyway. That you just need to pretty much take this into account when you're designing these. Otherwise, it won't work. Same as like monetization and free to play game won't work if you don't design it from the startup and you just duct tape it on top of it. Same with ad spot in IPs. So. What would you think currently would be the like at least some kind of estimate that the current let's say new generation crypto free to play whatever we call it hybrid game would make based on the revenue like we talk about the, that of course there's the possibility like you said Nico that the team can just live on the I guess it's it's a, like a matter of like a having value in the treasury that appreciates and like goes up and pretty much mm -hmm. team lives on team team lives on top of that mm -hmm. or if there's like a possibility to do some kind of like more stable kind of revenue or even subscription wise or something in that matter, because how I see it currently, so there's there's the possibility to get IAP and ad revenue from the free to play economy, let's say, or the, 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 mm. the, the base layer. And then we have the marketplace fees or the direct sales of the NFTs or cryptocurrency, if we control that. So there's like four sources that I see currently being the the whole thing. Do we see anything else in the pile? Like, how do you think the whole pile will then looks like? <laughs> it's a it's a hard question, man. Because I don't know if like how I currently see it. I don't think so. Living just on the marketplace fees is sustainable, but that's like too small of an amount to to live live through. If if we if we want to live in the same assumption that most of the budget of the expenses of a game company goes to marketing. To the because UA, then, basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because then we are under assumption that the organic growth is the one that's driving the company. Which oh, only, please yeah. stop yeah. the organic growth. These, like, these two <laughs> words next to each other, this organic growth doesn't exist. Yeah, let's trigger Matthew even more. This doesn't <laughs> exist. Come on, stop it. Are oh, you seeing red now? Oh, no, 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 no. Still, like, if you have a, like random top 50 free to play game 80% of the budget or 90% of the budget of the whole team is driving towards UA or marketing yeah. so how how a crypto business model would pretty much deal with this notion 
because currently I see like this is this is the problem I see with scaling the whole model currently because it's okay to scale it in the current environment of course and that's that's okay but the question is if you want to scale it to the, to the degree and even like continuously scale it because a lot of games uh, don't have a problem to have this kind of a global launch hype period that they live for like half a year or or pretty much they even live forever it's not a problem but the question is that they're not growing continuously because if we take, let's say, something like, I don't know, Empires and Puzzles, AFK Arena, or some of the big games in the top 30, top 50, uh, they scale to some, let's say, critical mass when they hit the ceiling on UA and on the CPI LTV formula, being, I don't know, 20 million, 30 million a month or something like that when they hit their margin. And then they remain there for some time, and then they downscale because the game is usually sunsetted and company moves to another game. So how this would look like in the long term within the crypto industry, or let's say crypto game model. Because if I, if I well, see... Stop, like, please. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Stop, stop. I want to hear what let's, Nico has to say on that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you, you asked like 20 questions, and if there is like a, a small pause where we think about like how to answer those, you just start again. <laughs> Wait. Yeah. Sorry, like it's, it's pretty much yeah, he's burning in my head. He's unstoppable. Burning in my Always. head whenever I hear about the business model. <laughs> okay, Jakub, give me like a one sentence question because I don't know what to answer now. Yeah. yeah. How how do you think a crypto game will deal with the UA or okay. the growth user of their user base? Yeah. I am. Um, I recently read a interesting article, uh, Matei. I think I, I sent it to you by Eric Sufford mm -hmm. about where he says that in the end, all companies go towards um, or all, all yep. types of games converge towards the UA that we currently see in free to play. Mm -hmm. That's the case that he they wanted to make. Um, I can see that happening for sure, um, and and happening within crypto games for sure. Um, that said, I also think that you know a current free to play game is like a relatively closed entity. It might be like a, a live ops game or a living game where they keep adding content. Yeah, um, game as a service. Game as a service, thank you. I think there's potential, um, but I'm not 100% that this is going to happen. There's potential for blockchain games to be kind of like eternal in a way, where like one, for example, um, a blockchain game that is fully on-chain, mm -hmm. the one I you know, described earlier, these are actually... so. There's no, like, these live forever by definition. Well, they, these live as long as mm. the blockchain lives. Yep. And so game V1, if, if a game V2 comes out, and that is a set of new smart contracts, the game creators can actually stop, not stop anyone from playing the original version of the game, funnily enough. So because it is, it's just there. Um, and so what I think could happen is that, you know, blockchain games have the potential to become, like, really, like, really big and ever evolving where you know they keep they keep growing um and so i can see a world where and, and sorry I'm, I'm really not fully answering your question i'm sorry for that no, just because i don't have the answer I, I i i see a world where you know they have um ecosystems like for example axie that just are almost like eternal in a way where you know you have the axie infinity current game right but then you would have you know new games out of top of that and then people would stop playing the initial game but there's because of the community and how they're you know involved and invested in the game because they own the tokens and the axes and the assets um they want to find a way to make this this work and to find new new games within that ecosystem and so you could say you could see um axie almost as you know marvel where you know marvel doesn't sunset if that makes sense right there's always new content created it's like a, it's a world mm -hmm. and there's more stuff happening within that world. And if you're within that world, just stay within that world. And I don't know, it's, it's, it, I think it's going to bring forth like a paradigm shift. Um, and that will, I don't know how that would answer your question, but um, that's, that's yeah. how I see. Do, do you but, mind I, I, I see this, I, I see this as, as you're saying, like as an example with Skyrim, where you have like a 10 year old game that's being propped up by the modding community and still feels fresh. Mm. Something like yes. that. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Felix, sorry. Yeah. Nico, are you expecting kind of LTVs in crypto games to be a lot higher than in free-to-play or a lot lower? I think a lot higher, for sure. Yeah. Um, I think games through, because games until now were by definition a hobby because there wasn't really money involved and also not a way to start earning money, um, or at least not legally um, or officially through the game. And I expect that paradigm to shift moving forward. 
where, you know, instead of seeing it as an expense, spending money in a game could be seen as, as an investment. And I mean, I see this happening with me, right? Um, look, like I'll, I'll go to the shop and, and like look for the, the cheapest food, but you know, <laughs> Spend a thousand dollars on a freaking photo on on the internet, right? Yeah, and your um, NFT gallery I, is just full of uh, everything, <laughs> full, of, full of terrible stuff and, and ruckles. <laughs> I know, thanks, man. No, but I mean, it's 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 because you really own the thing. I think things that the 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 mindset of players will shift, and and the fact that it's not an expense but something you could potentially sell either for the same amount, maybe for more, and in worst case for less. Um, and I think that will increase the willingness to pay of people. Yeah, and this like investing money into the the games is actually you know a very good retention mechanic because mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, obviously awesome. now if like you said uh, during one metacast like what you asked me about the day ninety retention of Axie Infinity and then we found out like it's like a, a work retention because they're yeah, just yeah, like yeah. <laughs> going to work every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's nice. That's true. Yeah. All right, Mr. Jakub, any, 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 anything else? Because, you know, uh, you're yeah, like, unstoppable. No, 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 I can continue. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, God. Please do this film. Because <laughs> yeah, I, can, I can return. Yeah, let, let's talk about that uh, last comment that Matty said, like when you invest into the game, because that's also one of the other burning questions in my head where the NFT design itself, or let's say the crypto layer design, usually in the, the free-to-play model, it works like that, that you pretty much defend your market share with the investment that players already sunk into your game because let's say people play a lot of match three games because it's normally by the design of their games that if you run out of lives on, on one game you switch to the other game and it's completely possible that you spend in all of those but if we take some mid-core rpg games or other games that are pretty much much more demanding on your time and also wallet you don't have time to, to interact with multiple of those so if a new game comes on the block you really, really, really need to justify the switch because you lose all that value, all that progress, and the game needs to really kick it to be better. So if I understand correctly, or let's say in the current spaces I see it, what would be what would be pretty much holding the players in, a, in their current game if, as you said, like if they can pretty much sell the value that they added to their progression and then pretty much all the progress that they did in the game immediately and transfer that progress into the head, the head start in the new game? Because that that's that's in the end is the interoperability <laughs> that I see being possible, but in the end this would crash or tank the previous game's economy. Um, I think fundamentally within Web three, as in other games, the most fun games will always do best. Mm -hmm. um, and and now with this, I'd like to introduce a new concept um, which was coined by Packy McCormick, and he called it the fun tier, um, and it is taking together fun and frontier. And so what I think will play out is um, you'll have two, ax you have two axes. You know, you have a graph with two axes and there's going to be fun mm -hmm. on one axis and earning potential on the other axis. And there's going to be a frontier like this where, you know, the more fun a game is, the less earning potential it will have. Or And when I say a game, I actually mean... It could be a game, but it could also be a part of a game, mm -hmm. a sub-part of a game. Because mm -hmm. actually, the, the way I see a lot of sustainable um, games evolve is in asymmetric gameplay, where there's a bunch of responsibilities within the game. Some people are mining ore, some people are enchanting, and then other people are actually you know battling and fighting mm -hmm. shit. And so the least fun activities will have higher earning potential because less people will want to do that. And if it's carefully balanced, I think, you know, those will have a higher earning potential and then other game or other parts of the game that have, you know, that are more fun will have less earning potential because more people are, are wanting to do that. And so to answer your question, I think that's, um, there's going to be a bunch of games and part of the game on that on that you know fun, fun tier and i think individual players will make decisions about you know one what they're good at um what they're in, what they enjoy doing and then also like how much they want to earn for their time and something like that and that's i think what's going to drive the the um the, the switching between games and I think new games will drive the frontier upwards. So there's going to be new games that offer more fun for the same amount of earning power. And then you'll see switches and, and you'll see adjustments made. Um, and that's kind of how I see this evolve. Okay. So basically if, uh, <clears throat> if like a uh, half of the players of XC infinity now, you know, cashes out everything and then moves on to, to other game that can fuck up the whole 
game basically right because the like transaction volume decreases everything just decreases and if like a whole uh, like player count just leaves what happens power to the players yeah that's that's the question like what happens then like the game i think dies? it depends it depends on on how many players are still coming in because yeah okay if you assume that that stream is, is steady and fixed, and obviously you can't do that, but if you just assume yeah. that for a bit, let's say there's you know 10,000 players a day who want to start playing Axie, so there's actually like a constant demand for mm -hmm. new Axies. Okay. And so if, if, the, if, if so, suddenly players stop playing, then the supply of SLP, which is needed to breed Axies, actually goes down, which will increase the price of SLP and of Axies because the supply goes down, demand stays the same. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly the... the, the you know, the potential earning potential. So it's going to go up in terms of earning power for the same fund. Mm -hmm. mm. um, and, and, and I think that's, that's how that would play out. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's going to, you know, it's not going to be not fun anymore. It's still going to be fun if it's a good game, even though people mm -hmm. will leave or the economy mm -hmm. will crash. So what, what's pretty much Nico said there, that like if mm -hmm. the fun part never dies, <laughs> like if you want to play <laughs> the game and relax, like the economy won't, I guess it, it won't if it's designed in a way that it won't crash itself because sometimes crashing the economy can also crash the fun part. Mm -hmm. What we've seen with, let's say, Diablo Auction House, where going on the auction house <laughs> was basically better than playing the game. <laughs> And you are yeah, saying that I be think because you are the pet of exile fan, so uh, you know. Mm. <laughs> like, no, is it great? They reset their economy every three months. It wouldn't work other way. I'll, um, I'll, I'll, um, I'm looking at a game which builds Path of Exile, but then uh, on chain or not on chain, but uh, with crypto elements. So I'll, I'll definitely, you know, sh share that with you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when once they're going more more, more public, um, uh, I was going to say something, but I forgot. Ah, sorry, so, I interrupted you. No, no worries. <laughs> I had a head of Excel economy is like a great, great example of like how to run things because they, their currencies all have intrinsic value because they're all crafting materials. So there's always demand for them. Mm -hmm. And they know that they cannot really run the thing. Like one thing is that the new mechanics brings in flavor to the game and they, they live on these kind of player spikes during each three, three months where people come in, they run the new content and then they leave and then they come back. Like there's, I, I know that there's no such thing in the industry, but they exactly live on this. And the spikes are getting bigger, actually. So mm. the game's growing. Mm. And and the other thing is that also they have their, they, they weren't doing this before. They have their standard league, but they don't care about the economy in the standard league that much because it's so unbalanced and so, you know, run or pretty much plagued by bots or anything else that there's pretty much running there. Nobody met. It, it doesn't matter because the new mechanic when the league runs is only the temporary league. So everybody just switches there. And, and the system works great, actually. But they know that they won't probably ever add the, the auction house, the one similar to Diablo, because they don't want to actively facilitate the trading. Because it, they would run into the same problem. So they, they, they know that the trading is really bad. You can do it, but you need to go through like a lot of play friction <laughs> and everything and get <laughs> scammed a lot of times. But it works, but they won't facilitate it because they would know that they would run into the same problems that Yapo did. Mm. Yeah. All right. I think uh, we have like one last topic. So I mean, we have like ten more minutes. So let's uh, let's do let's do it. Let's do it. Let's let's talk about the NFTs because I mean uh, that's, that's my favorite thing. I don't own any NFT. You don't own but, a single one. Uh, not a single what? one. Not yet. You might transfer yeah, you one after this call. Yep. Okay. Well, then uh, I will shut up. I'll leave it to, <laughs> leave it, to it. <laughs> yeah. NFTs, this, uh, for me, also, this is like a really interesting topic because usually you don't really operate with something that needs to be, needs to at, at least preserve value long term in any game, game economy. Because inflation actually is a great tool in Game Designers Toolkit that you. When you want to add new content to game, usually the old content is a sacrifice of that inflation. Mm. Like, best example would be World of Warcraft expansions. Like I remember really, really, really well the stories when the Burning Crusade would hit in and the guy in like blue or green gear on 62 would pretty much steamroll over you when you were full epics on 60 still. And that, that's how they do it. And it's a great window of opportunity for new players to jump in and pretty much get on the track with the whole game and not fight against people that are decked out for the last three years. And, and power creep is pretty much a gameplay mechanic that people use in order to progress into games. So even more and more that I see the current crypto space, 
I guess it will become some kind of a normal way of things of having destroyable NFTs or NFTs that are not permanent. Let's say the current implementation that I saw within Crypto Raiders, even Titan Arena have their heroes that they have some kind of internal energy. And I think that's a good thing because I guess more than we go to this kind of level of not inflated expectations within like play to own, it, it seems like completely normal to me. Then that, wait, yeah, wait, I wait, can... wait, 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 wait. So you, you purchase or like pay a lot of money or invest a lot of money for an NFT and then mm -hmm. it's, uh, it destroys after you use it. But you, it brings you value in the process. For instance, you trade the energy with an engagement mm -hmm. fund and get the cryptocurrency in return. Okay. All right. That, that's that's how makes the, sense. That's, <laughs> that's even how the model with Tetan Arena ran. Like people would buy the new heroes, then they would farm the cryptocurrency with it. And when they were hitting this kind of a sweet spot of an energy, they would sell them on the market. So, so, so they would be still be able to sell them, but they would have the Which profit. Which creates even more speculation in that case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. Okay. That's why. Okay. I love it. <laughs> I But, but okay. in general, it seems to me like it will be normal. Yeah, go ahead, Nico, sorry. No, I was going to say, I mean, the speculation is still uh, the name of the game within yeah. crypto, right? So, uh, I think <laughs> no one denies that, um, except for maybe hardcore crypto bros who are like, no, everyone plays this game for fun. It's amazing. Look at the community, <laughs> man. Um, this is, you know, buy the NFT. Um, anyway, so I think apart from those dudes, um, everyone, like people realize that the, the way the, why we've we're seeing such insane prices is pure mm -hmm. speculative yeah. um and it's not sustainable would you say uh, the speculation part of crypto games right now is his biggest threat currently the biggest fun oh, biggest threat yeah <laughs> biggest threat to like wild skate adoption yeah mm. i think it's um it's definitely it's definitely not good right the fact mm. that um You know, the industry is seen, you know, I think a lot of hate from traditional gamers and maybe also game developers comes from the fact that there's so much speculation and there's so many, you know, crypto bros who are shilling their bags and so many rook pulls, so many scams. Um, and, and the problem is that these things are to be expected, right? In the beginning, I said, you know, blockchain is adding a value layer on top of the internet and the internet was already with the wild west and now you give people the tools <laughs> to freaking you know transport value over that thing so you can be sure that there's like a large sets especially within the nft not necessarily gaming world but also in the gaming world um, there's a lot of scams and there's going to be a lot of scams and there's a lot of speculation and um you know my expectation is that more than 99 of current nfts um will be worth less in the long run Mm. that's that's my expectation same with with games in general um uh but i think you know that doesn't and, and so that's why i think it's it's a bad thing for adoption because it's it gives, it gives a negative perception but honestly like i i'm less i'm not bothered by it because i think it's inevitable right mm. as, as we said there, there's bad actors out there yeah. there's people who just want to make a quick buck and they're gonna find the tools and use that um and so i think you know it's 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 negative it's it's not helping Um, but I don't consider it the biggest threat. I think, you know, bigger threats. Um, I personally believe that massive crypto adoption is inevitable. Um, it's a matter of time. And I think the biggest threats, and when I say threats, I think, you know, what's going to make this take longer than mm -hmm. it would otherwise do is probably a regulation. Mm. Um, uh, and yeah. I don't think, you know, speculation is, is necessarily bad. I mean, look, look at Axie, right? Axie, I think a lot of people got into Axie kind of out of speculation um, and it actually made the you know the um, adoption faster mm -hmm. ironically true very true oh man this was amazing this was, was so great so great <laughs> I would love to thank you all guys for uh, for this session full of crypto um, knowledge I would say jamming yeah jamming. <laughs> very good So, uh, yeah, thank you very much, guys, and thank you very much uh, to our listeners as well. Don't, don't forget to subscribe on our YouTube channels. All these four uh, beautiful faces are going to be there in a very short amount of time. And then, uh, yeah, talk to you next week. Thank you very much, guys. Bye-bye. See you. Bye, Thanks. everyone. Cheers.